ist Lena Bassermann. Ich arbeite für das Entwicklungspolitische Netzwerk in Kota. Ich freue mich, dass heute Morgen ähm, so ja, viele schon einige den Weg zu uns gefunden haben, um über die Umsetzung der UN-Erklärung ähm, der Rechte von Bäuerinnen und Bauern und anderen Menschen, die im ländlichen Raum arbeiten, ähm, kurz und trock in Deutschland zu sprechen. Das Seminar ähm, veranstalten wir gemeinsam mit der Arbeitsgemeinschaft Bäuerliche Landwirtschaft, mit FIA in Deutschland, mit Unterstützung ähm, von der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung, Miserio, Brot für die Welt, mit Friedensdienst Oxfam Deutschland, Fairtrade und Fairtrade ähm, Deutschland. Ähm, die Untrop wurde im Dezember 2018 verabschiedet von der Vollversammlung der Vereinten Nationen und stellt einen wirklichen Meilenstein ähm, für das Recht auf Nahrung dar. Wir sind jetzt in einer Situation, ähm, in der alle Staaten aufgefordert sind, die Inhalte der Erklärung umzusetzen und ähm, damit der Menschen, die Rechte der Menschen zu stärken, die in der Landwirtschaft und in der Weiterverarbeitung landwirtschaftlicher Produkte arbeiten. Ähm, und genau darum ähm, soll es in unserem Seminar gehen, nämlich die Umsetzung der UNTROP. Wir freuen uns, dass wir heute den Auftakt bilden können zu der dreiteiligen Seminarserie. Ähm, und ähm, die sich so nun wie folgt zusammensetzt. Eigentlich war es mal als dreiteiliges Präsenzseminar geplant. Nun aufgrund der ähm, Covid-19-Situation haben wir uns entschieden, ein zweigeteiltes Seminar zu machen. Zunächst zwei Online-Sitzungen heute und am Dienstag. Und am Mittwoch wird dann in Kassel ein Präsenzseminar stattfinden. Vielleicht noch für ganz kurz entschlossene, wer noch nach Kassel kommen möchte, kann sich auch gerne im Anschluss noch bei uns melden. Ähm, ich werde jetzt noch mal kurz was zum Ablauf sagen und vor allen Dingen zur Technik ähm, zuerst. Vielleicht mal das Wichtigste ähm, vorneweg. Sie sehen unten in der Leiste ähm, ein Symbol, ähm, das so aussieht. Ich halte es mal in die Kamera. Ähm, das ist für die Dolmetschung. Also es gibt die Möglichkeit, ähm, das ähm, Seminar auf Englisch oder auf Deutsch anzuhören. Ähm, wie Sie hören, ähm, ich, die Moderation und die Fragen werden auf Deutsch sein. Die Vorträge sind beide auf Englisch. Wer das auf Deutsch übersetzt bekommen möchte, kann das unten auswählen und eben auch umgekehrt. Wenn es Fragen dazu gibt oder Probleme für den technischen Support, bitte alles in die Chat-Funktion schreiben, die wir haben, die Sie auch hier unten sehen. Und da können quasi werden die Fragen dann auch direkt beantwortet. Wie Sie auch gemerkt haben, ist die Kamerafunktion ausgeschaltet. Und wir möchten die ähm, Fragen, Rückfragen zu den Präsentationen und auch zur Diskussion gerne alle über die Fragen- und Antwortfunktion, die Sie unter dem F und A auch hier unten mit den beiden Sprechblasen unten im Bild ähm, sehen können. Ähm, dort einfach alles reinschreiben, ähm, was Sie zu den Vorträgen, zu dem Thema ähm, wissen möchten. Ähm, Gertrud Falk von FIA in Deutschland wird die Fragen sammeln, auch ein bisschen clustern und sich dann ähm, zu Wort melden, um die Fragen auch zu stellen. Ein weiterer Punkt, wir zeichnen das Webinar auf, ähm, möchten natürlich alle datenrechtlichen ähm, Sachen wahren und werden das daher auch nicht die Fragen, also die Namen, die im, in der Frage- und Antwortfunktion auftauchen, laut vorlesen. Also das wird anonymisiert quasi ähm, gestellt werden. Ähm, genau, also das waren jetzt erstmal so die kurzen technischen Punkte vorab. Ich freue mich sehr, dass ähm, Ramona Dumicu und ähm, Genevieve Savigny, beide von der Europäischen Koordination von La Vie Campesina, heute bei uns sind und freue mich sehr auf die Vorträge. Ähm, jetzt freue ich mich aber zunächst und ich ähm, muss jetzt einmal ähm, schauen, ob Georg ähm, Jansen von der ähm, Arbeitsgemeinschaft Bäuerlicher Landwirtschaft schon bei uns ist. Ähm, er wird nämlich zuerst ein kurzes Grußwort auch von Seiten der ABL ähm, noch an uns richten. Ähm, genau, ich muss jetzt. Gibt's, ähm, genau, Georg, bist du schon da? Weil er kam direkt aus einer anderen Sitzung. Das war, glaube ich, jetzt ganz knapp bei ihm, ähm, dass er es pünktlich schafft. Ich glaube. Ich glaube, er ist noch nicht da, wenn ich das... Äh, ah, jetzt ist sie da. Gut, Anne-Marie Schreck ist da. Okay, dann würde ich jetzt mal das ähm, Wort an Georg Jansen übergeben. Georg 
Georg. Okay, ich kann ihn nicht hören. Ne, wir können Georg leider nicht hören. Ähm, Gerade im Test hat das ähm, vorhin funktioniert. Ähm, Okay, da gibt es, glaube ich, ein technisches Problem. Ähm, deshalb würde ich jetzt ähm, das spontan einfach so machen, dass ähm, ich jetzt schon mal ähm, wir weitermachen und ich ähm, kurz Ramona ähm, Dominici vorstelle und wir ihren Vortrag hören und ähm, wir dann einfach nachher von Georg Jansen noch mal ähm, ein paar Worte hören werden. Ähm, Ramona, ähm, vielleicht kurz einleiten ein paar Worte zu Ramona. Sie ist ähm, selbst Bäuerin und ähm, kommt aus Rumänien. Sie ist ähm, Mitglied des Koordinierungskomitees von ähm, Eco Rurales. Das ist eine Kleinbauernorganisation in Rumänien und ist, wie schon gesagt, Mitglied des ähm, Koordinierungskomitees der Europäischen Koordination von La Via Campesina. Ähm, ich, ähm, La Via Campesina ist wahrscheinlich... Meistens ein Begriff ist ein Zusammenschluss von insgesamt über 30 nationalen, regionalen Bauernorganisationen, Landarbeitern, ländlichen Organisationen aus über 21 europäischen Ländern. Ich kenne Ramona Dimitri vor allen Dingen, weil sie in internationalen politischen Prozessen auch sehr aktiv ist. Sie ist Mitglied des Koordinierungsausschusses des zivilgesellschaftlichen Mechanismus beim Welternährungsausschuss der Vereinten Nationen, dem CFS. Ähm, dort ist sie im Moment, koordiniert sie mit den Verhandlungsprozess zu den freiwilligen Leitlin Leitlinien für Ernährungssystem. Ein kontroverser Prozess, der gerade läuft. Da war sie auch die ganze Woche sehr eingespannt und deshalb freue ich mich umso mehr, dass sie heute Zeit hat, äh, trotzdem Zeit gefunden hat, ähm, hier dabei zu sein und uns einen Vortrag zu halten. Ähm, sie wird zunächst die etwas sagen, zu dem, wie es zu Untrop kam, zu den Hintergründen, ähm, was der Wert ist der Untrop aus bäuerlicher Sicht und wird Bezüge herstellen zu aktuellen politischen Prozessen und wie die und ob die dazu Anwendung kommen kann. Ähm, daher würde ich jetzt das Wort an Ramona übergeben und ähm, ja und Alisha bitten die Präsentation auch. Thank you so much and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing uh, such an important discussion. Because uh, in these uh, um, incredible times that we're living, critical times that we're living, uh, talking about human rights and especially about the rights of the, the essential people who produce the food to feed the world uh, is the most uh, important thing. It, and it's the most timely, uh, timely thing that uh, we can do. Um, we, I, I prepared the presentation, so uh, if it's possible to, to share it on the screen. Um, so my presentation is structured basically on uh, three questions and uh, the first question that um, uh, I would like to address is uh, really about the history uh, of uh, the UN Declaration for the Rights of Peasants that you just heard before it was uh, approved uh, two years ago in the, in the United Nations. Um, where does it come from also in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of need? Um, so uh, the necessity to have an instrument that protects and promotes uh, our rights as human, uh, humans that live in the rural areas and produce food um, came from sufferance, came from the fact that uh, the, the rural communities, uh, the most uh, vulnerable people, the poor, um, are more and more discriminated against, uh, marginalized by the society, uh, exploited uh, oftentimes, and uh, have their rights violated. So <clears throat> the existing instruments uh, that address human rights don't seem to be um, strong enough to protect the, the rural people. So there, there was a need to have something that is uh, particular, that is adapted to the, to the situation um, and that protects uh, in, a, in a very specific way the, the people who work with land, with seeds, with water resources and, uh, and produce food. Um, the, as you know, 
we have uh, La Via Campesina as an international peasant movement who um, was the space where this, uh, this thinking articulated the, for the fact that we need to protect our human rights and we need to go to the highest level and build uh, instruments uh, to protect us because otherwise uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to disappear. Um, and the first organization, a member organization in La Via Campesina to um, generate, to spark uh, these uh, discussions was uh, 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 SPI, Serikat Petani from Indonesia, who actually played a major role throughout the entire process. Uh, just to illustrate uh, the, the, the extremely long process and complex process that involved thousands of people um, who organized protests, who organized events, lobbied their own governments, uh, educated the public, discussed uh, and built partnerships within the civil society, with academics uh, and with many, many actors that uh, actually contributed to this, uh, this history and this uh, uh, process uh, of, of peasant rights. So this is just an illustration that you see now uh, on the screen. It started in 2001 and concluded uh, successfully in 2018. So for 17 years, um, we, we, we worked together. We uh, started officially the process in the Human Rights Council in 2013. Um, and uh, after, uh, after having five sessions of negotiations in Geneva, uh, we managed to have uh, the official adoption in uh, New York in 2018 at the General Assembly. Um, if we go forward now uh, with our uh, presentation, I would just like to um, uh, mark some key moments in, uh, in this history. I mean, uh, German people actually know a lot about uh, uh, this declaration uh, because um, Germany played an important role. The German civil society was extremely active, uh, lobbying its own government and supporting also the global uh, process. And we have uh, we had actually a key moment in in the process in uh, Schwabisch Hall in uh, Germany in 2017. Uh, we organized a very important congress, bringing together uh, allies organizations, but also. Um, German uh, of German officials and uh, and different uh, different supporters from from many many sectors uh, to and this moment actually uh, was was uh, internally and organizationally um, crucial quite crucial it was just uh, the year before the adoption of the declaration and uh, uh, it really pushed us through uh, through the uh, eventual adoption. Uh, and going forward, just uh, just for you to see, this was the last negotiation session. It's a moment in time, back in 2018, where we have together indigenous people sitting with us, fisher folks, uh, workers, so uh, people, con uh, so basically representatives of food producers constituencies who uh, work together in partnership, and of course, uh, different NGOs from human rights, uh, uh, domain or to, to different kinds of other domains. We have uh, obviously some German, uh, some German participants there as always. And um, if we go forward now to the next slide, we see the, uh, just this uh, final moment where we uh, managed to get the, adoption, the declaration adopted. Um, lobbying Europe, it was not easy. Um, most of European countries, as you can see here, and as you probably already know, abstained. Uh, but uh, the fact that the German, that uh, Europe as a whole didn't play a negative part in this was thanks to the incredible of work of uh, all the organizations uh, from our region and the farmers' organizations, especially, uh, who lobbied our governments to uh, at least not uh, damage the final result. Uh, and to allow this declaration to be adopted because it's, uh, it's also uh, a, an instrument that it's needed in Europe, not only in the global south, uh, where indeed the, the situation of the small farmers is dramatic. Uh, going, uh, going forward, the second question we uh, need to ask ourselves and to answer, uh, to try to answer is really what is the added value and the uh, power of this uh, instrument from a peasant perspective? Well, 
Um, first of all, I would like to uh, tell you um, that there is a, there is the, the having rights. It's very important because uh, rights are different from uh, other concepts. You know that uh, governments are using or the private sector is using uh, to to say that everything is uh, is okay. First of all, uh, we would uh, I would like to tell you that there is an important difference between rights and access because. Uh, access uh, always depends on what kind of resources we have available. For example, financial resources. We have money, we have access to the market, we have access to infrastructure, we have access to many things. Um, access also doesn't uh, prioritize social issues. For example, uh, it doesn't matter that you're uh, poor or it doesn't matter that you come from a vulnerable uh, uh, place. Uh, it's not never access is never about prioritizing uh, you know the, the vulnerable and affected communities while human rights are uh, actually about all that and uh, they're universal uh, they're applicable to the people to all people especially to the ones that are in need that are uh, discriminated against they're um, and they're also defined and protected by law they're not um, uh, they're not just applied uh, selectively, they are uh, they they're guaranteed. So uh, being being included in, in law, it's very important, and being recognized and negotiated and accepted by government is very important. And just a, a small differentiations between um, rights of uh, humans and rights of corporations, because uh, in the past century we witnessed uh, uh, an evolution of the rights of corporations, uh, for example, and um, corporations' rights include uh, intellectual property rights, patents, uh, copyrights, and they are applied uh, not only to they, oh, they are applied in some cases to people as well, but they are applied mostly to uh, juridical entities, to companies, uh, and. Human rights. Uh, human rights have uh, different kinds of categories uh, that protect our uh, protect us from a social point of view, from a civil point of view, economic, uh, culturally, uh, politically, and they are applied only to people. The human the human rights. And uh, this is the, this is an important distinction that we we need to make when we try to see how important uh, uh, and powerful uh, is to have uh, human rights and particularly having peasant rights. If we go forward to the next slide, um, we, uh, we have to try to understand what exactly did we achieve uh, through this peasant rights declaration. In the United Nations system, uh, we have recognized the social rights, the cultural rights, the economic rights, political and civil rights. What, and the, what we managed to achieve through this declaration is uh, getting nat rights to natural resources. For people in the rural areas who produce food, for peasants, um, it's uh, fundamental, the, the, the access and having uh, rights to the natural resources is uh, extremely important because uh, the natural resources for us are primary means of production. Without them, we cannot be peasants. Without land, without seeds, without water, we cannot be uh, what, uh, uh, what we really are. So going forward to the next slide, we uh, just briefly can see in the declaration, in the content of the declaration, what these um, natural rights to natural resources are. Uh, first of all, they're mentioned uh, in the definition. So our nature is uh, of the people who are in, living in the rural areas and they're connected to uh, the land, not only as a occupation, but as a, uh, as, a, as a way of life. And we have a specific right to land and uh, natural resources. We have a specific right to um, environment uh, a right to seeds, right to biological diversity and to water that are articulated in the in the declaration. And of course, the declaration, thanks to the work of German organization, it has been translated into German. And you can see in, in detail how uh, these rights are defined. Um, going forward to the next slide. To the next slide. Um, we really have to understand what does this uh, piece of paper, uh, how, how, 
how we have to uh, transform this piece of paper into something that becomes reality that actually changes for the better uh, the life and livelihoods of uh, of us the food producers the the rural men and the and women around the globe well um, it means first of all to get organized to and to push nobody is going to implement this declaration for us we will have to continue to do the work uh, ourselves we are talking about a voluntary instrument that countries are not forced to implement automatically in the national legislation so the efforts to um, uh, to uh, to inf you know to implement this declaration must continue and we must uh, always take the lead uh, first of all um, the process must be built collectively the more actors are involved in the implementation process uh, the bigger are the chances for this declaration to to be implemented uh, it starts with uh, making awareness first of all uh, of our authorities but also the larger public and of course the, the peasants themselves there are a lot of peasants hundreds of millions of peasants around the world who are not aware that, that their rights have been defined in the united nations systems and that they are not aware that they can claim these rights and they can use these rights to defend themselves so awareness is key uh, and then uh, we need to build capacity uh, for for the peasants and the farmers organizations to uh, to learn how to lobby to learn how to uh, promote this instrument and uh, push for authorities to recognize uh, this these rights and then um, we need to have inclusive processes uh, in many countries around the world including in in, in europe uh, governments are not used to uh, discuss with us and to include us in decision making processes so we need to push always for uh, our rights to be at the table and discuss about agricultural policies and use always uh, this instrument to make uh, to make a case for the smallholders and then partnerships uh, partnership is key partnership cooperation coordination in the society as a whole uh, bringing together farmers uh, bringing together uh, consumers, being, building together um, NGOs, br bringing together academics. We need absolutely everybody uh, to get with us in this uh, in this struggle. And finally, um, another key point in uh, in uh, making sure that this declaration is uh, implemented is, is monitoring and evaluation. We need to always. Uh, keep accountable governments and ask them where they are with the implementation of this declaration. Um, why don't they implement it already? Uh, how always monitor how many rights continue to be violated despite the fact that we have this uh, pr uh, instrument that protects our right in the United Nations system, and uh, report this uh, this uh, violations and report it to the government and to uh, other international fora. Okay, so go, we have to uh, understand the, the time is of issue, so we will continue uh, with the slides. Next and next slide. We're not going to get uh, into details uh, thematically how, uh, what kind of requirements are necessary for uh, uh, peasant rights to be respected in the national legislation. We're going to go straight to the um, uh, last question uh, because. Uh, you know this uh, this uh, united nations declaration has global implications uh, and we need to connect it with the different uh, global processes and to different uh, existing instruments in order to um, to implement it uh, going forward to the next slide i prepared for you next slide uh, so this is an illustration that shows you how complex uh, the united nations system is and uh, how um, hard the work is really to at global level to connect uh, the declaration to to make all the spaces that are relevant for food and agriculture uh, talk about uh, peasant rights yes there are some uh, there, there is a new instrument that uh, needs to be connected with uh, with uh, different uh, negotiations processes or with different uh, works of united nations agencies or that needs to be discussed in the implementation of other treaties other uh, other instruments uh, globally, there are three uh, UN spaces uh, around the world that are relevant for, for us. It's Geneva, where, which is a space of uh, uh, generally uh, where we talk about human rights. It's Rome, where we generally talk about uh, food security and the nutrition. And it's New York, where we talk mostly about the, uh, the, the more political 
um, it's the most political uh, fora space of the United Nations, where we have uh, the General Assembly uh, of the United Nations and other uh, UN uh, charter bodies. In, uh, in this scheme, you see different, uh, different uh, level of uh, different spaces. You see, uh, as I said, the uh, treaties. Uh, you see, uh, in terms of treaties, there are uh, interesting, uh, important uh, uh, treaties that uh, are relevant. For example, in Geneva, we have the Convention on Biological Diversity. In uh, Rome, we have the International Treaty for Plant Genetic uh, Resources. And uh, in New York, we have the UN Framework for uh, Action against uh, for Action on Climate Change, and uh, we have different uh, agencies uh, and the institutions. For example, in Geneva, we have the uh, Human Rights Council. In Rome, we have the uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and in New York, we have the uh, ECOSOC, which is the uh, Economic and Social Council uh, of the UN. And uh, all of these spaces are connected. Uh, all of these spaces are relevant for us because uh, we try with this declaration to shift the paradigm in uh, public policies, uh, um, how public policies are shaped for agriculture um, from an economic perspective where uh, governments try to uh, support the ones who make profit, uh, the most rich, uh, towards a uh, uh, direction of human rights, where the poorest and the most vulnerable people are put, uh, are prioritized and put at the center and at the table uh, of decisions. So this is this is just the, the global picture going forward. To the next slide. To the next slide. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a picture. No, no, no. Up. So this is just another picture to show you um, how uh, the European processes are um, relevant and uh, also uh, how complex they are uh, in the European uh, Union, but also in our uh, region as a whole, because Europe is not uh, exclusively uh, composed of uh, EU, uh, EU space. So we have on one hand the European Union political uh, processes where we have, you know, all the, the known institutions from the, from the Parliament to the European Commission to uh, the European uh, Union's Council with all the relevant uh, subsidiary uh, uh, spaces. And we have also FAO in our region, which in, uh, includes also countries from uh, Eastern Europe and also Central Asia. Uh, and uh, we, when we look at our region, we also need to see, uh, uh, not, look not only at the institutional spaces, but also uh, what kind of spaces of alliance we have built. And we, um, La Via Campesina, together with our allies, built uh, the uh, Alliance for Food Sovereignty for uh, Europe and Central Asia, which is called the Nieleni. Uh, most of you probably know about it. It's, it's a space of alliance that allows us to, uh, to uh, influence uh, discussions with governments and with, uh, uh, with institutions in our, in our region. Uh, going forward, going forward. Just, um, it's really important uh, to know that, uh, you know, the work is, is, is really complex. It's, uh, it's quite difficult to include the peasant rights in different uh, international processes. I listed here three uh, processes where the peasant rights are being uh, lobbied. The first one is uh, uh, an instrument that uh, is for food systems and nutrition, voluntary guidelines for food systems and uh, nutrition. It's an instrument that is being negotiated uh, right now. Actually, after this call, uh, I'm participating in this, uh, in this uh, process uh, from, uh, on behalf of La Via Campesina uh, through the civil society and the indigenous people's uh, mechanism who is ensuring the relation with uh, the Global Committee for Food uh, Security. Uh, so this instrument is, is uh, under negotiation by, by governments. It's supposed to conclude uh, in December 2020. Um, 
after after concluding this uh, this uh, wonderful event with you i will uh, step in the negotiations which are right now happening um there there's a lot of support from uh, from some countries uh, in, uh, for including uh, uh, peasant rights and including references to the UN Declaration of uh, the Rights of Peasants in, in these voluntary guidelines. Uh, but there are also countries who uh, strongly oppose, uh, like for example, uh, the United States and the Russian Federation. Uh, but we do have from our region strong support from Switzerland and uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, unfortunately, European Union is not as open. Uh, they are supporting, but in a, you know, uh, uh, tempered, extremely tempered way. And actually, it's important uh, uh, to have this conversation because it's the German government who represents the voice of uh, the European Union in this negotiation because right now Germany has the presidency of the European uh, uh, Council. So, uh, what a timely discussion and uh, what a relevant uh, discussion indeed. The results of uh, these negotiations, so these voluntary guidelines, will actually uh, contribute to the United Nations Summit for, for Food Systems, which is supposed to take place next year. And we're hoping that uh, having integrated the, the, the peasant rights in these voluntary guidelines will help uh, also influence discussions in this uh, uh, UN System uh, Summit which is uh, unfortunately also not an ideal, uh, not an ideal, ideal event, but uh, the, nobody said it's going to be easy, for sure. There are other uh, examples, you, you see them uh, listed there, but I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, we can probably go forward. Uh, there are uh, different instruments that have been already negotiated that will always try to link with uh, with peasant rights, already achieved the uh, uh, rights in, in, for example, uh, when it comes to rights to seed, we have this international treaty for plant uh, genetic resources. Uh, for the European Union uh, space, we have an interesting uh, new organic farming rule uh, that has some uh, interesting stipulations on uh, the right to sell seeds, uh, from heterogeneous materials, so from uh, traditional seeds and other uh, other instruments uh, that uh, complement uh, the the United Nations uh, Declaration for the Rights of Peasants from other perspectives. Uh, going forward, I will finish with a very short uh, parallel with another declaration. Um, for the rights of indigenous people, which is a very similar instrument to UNDROP, to the Peasant Rights Declaration. Uh, in the case of the indigenous people, they uh, negotiated over 30 years, so much longer than, um, than uh, us, than the peasants. And um, it was adopted the, uh, in, back in 2007. Let's just go forward to the next slide. Well, uh, this is just an uh, illustration to, to show you where the indigenous people are active in the United Nations system uh, so that they promote um, the, the, their rights, to promote their uh, indigenous people's rights and the uh, implementation of their declaration. Uh, just like uh, in the previous illustration they, uh, where we show the global processes, they're active in uh, different spaces from Rome, New York, Geneva. Uh, and um, for example, they have their, their interest, uh, they have a strong interest in, uh, in uh, climate change spaces, uh, in spaces that deal with pesticides uh, or with uh, uh, dangerous uh, substances in, in mining. And uh, they're also active in uh, WTO, which is a different, uh, uh, dif different uh, strategy than La Via Campesina. Uh, they they, they um, criticize the, the World Trade Organization by participating uh, uh, inside it, inside its, uh, its process. So uh, there are, uh, there are uh, similarities um, with, uh, with what we're doing as La Via Campesina, but there are also uh, different ways, different approaches uh, from the, um, the indigenous people's side. And just maybe let's go uh, forward. And this is the last uh, slide. There is a long list of uh, mechanisms that the indigenous people build in the United Nations system uh, to support the implementation of uh, their declaration and their rights overall. And I would just say that um, uh, what, what they created is, for example, a special rapporteur uh, on the rights of indigenous people, which is a very interesting um, institution, actually. 
that uh, is uh, supporting the, the that is monitoring uh, what, uh, the declaration the implementation of the indigenous people's declaration and that it's reporting on uh, violations of indigenous people's rights to many uh, United Nations bodies from uh, Geneva, Rome, and uh, New York. And um, uh, another interesting thing that uh, the indigenous people did, they, they had until now two decades of uh, for the indigenous people, which are frameworks where um, governments are encouraged to promote public policies in uh, uh, support of indigenous peoples and uh, of course they created uh, different bodies in different uh, spaces Geneva and uh, and New York that uh, monitor uh, promote the declaration monitor its implementation and uh, uh, so on and so forth so this would be uh, it from my side I'm really sorry for taking so long uh, thank you so much the Please just show the last uh, last picture. It's a it's a peasant lady from my from my village that is working uh, in the in the vineyard of my family farm. So thank you so much, and uh, looking forward for the questions session. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Ramona, um, für diesen um, sehr ausführlichen Überblick. Um, zum einen, wie die Geschichte oder wie es zur Untrop kam, aber vor allen Dingen auch, was jetzt so die Schritte der Umsetzung sind und vor allen Dingen diese Komplexität nochmal darzustellen ähm, im internationalen System, im UN-System. Ich ähm, würde, ich glaube, es sind jetzt über die Frage- und Antwort-Funktion, ähm, wenn ich das richtig gesehen habe, ähm, Gertrud meldet sich. Ähm, ich würde einmal kurz an Gertrud übergeben, habe dann aber auch noch eine Frage. <lacht> ja, die erste der Kurze Frage ist äh, an dich, Ramona, ob es möglich wäre, deine Präsentation hinterher den Teilnehmern, Teilnehmerinnen zur Verfügung zu stellen. Ramona, ich glaube, du bist noch ähm, stumm geschaltet. Kannst du? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh the presentation is available to the organizers and uh, I think it would be uh, nice. It's unfortunately in English, but um, absolutely I'm, I would be extremely happy to that this declaration, this presentation is shared, of course. Okay. Super, genau, dann machen wir das um, natürlich sehr gerne hinterher. Gertrud, ja. hattest du noch mehr? Um, sind, es waren nur Fragen jetzt zwischendurch zum, zum Verlauf, die sind beantwortet, wenn ich das richtig sehe. Wenn ich das falsch verstanden habe, bitte ich die Fragenden, das nochmal zu schreiben. Ähm, sonst sehe ich gerade keine ähm, neuen Fragen. Ich hätte eine, aber Lena, du hattest auch eine. Ja, bitte. Also meine Frage an Ramona ist, ich habe jetzt gesehen, dass ihr sehr ähm, intensiv auch nochmal reingeht in so freiwillige Prozesse bei den Vereinten Nationen, bei der FAO zum Beispiel, dass ihr dort die UNDROP in solche freiwilligen Richtlinien oder Standards reinbringt. Und das ist jetzt eine Frage von mir. Ist das nicht ein, ein Rückschritt? Weil ihr habt ja nun schon eine mehr oder weniger verbindliche Menschenrechtserklärung erreicht. Und freiwillige Richtlinien sind ja viel schwächer völkerrechtlich gesehen. Ähm, wie, wie ist das zu bewerten? Warum macht ihr das? Und warum konzentriert ihr euch nicht stärker auf neue, richtig verbindliche ähm, rechtliche Instrumente. Das wäre meine Frage. Ramona, kannst du direkt darauf antworten? Ja, yeah, well, um, it, it, uh, this, it's actually the objective of La Via Campesina that uh, this uh, declaration uh, is used to create also a binding instrument, an instrument that is uh, um, obliging the governments to implement it in the national uh, uh, legislations. Um, in terms of content, uh, the Declaration for the Rights of Peasants is much more advanced than the Universal Declaration for the Human Rights, uh, simply because uh, of the time when the U Universal Declaration for Human Rights was created, uh, we didn't have problems with Monsanto, who was going uh, in the fields of the people to claim um, their copyrights uh, over human rights. Uh, and to punish uh, farmers for being accidentally contaminated against their will with genetically modified uh, organisms. Uh, 
which is something that uh, this uh, uh, this declaration for the rights of uh, peasants is uh, addressing uh, very well. So um, the it's not at all a step back. The the peasant rights declaration it's actually a, a huge step forward, but it's important that uh, we continue the work at global level and at national level, most importantly. Um, to create also a binding uh, instrument based on this uh, peasant rights declaration. Mhm. Ja, ich habe jetzt noch eine Fra weitere Frage. Ich weiß nicht, Lena, ob du erst deine stellen möchtest. Nee, nee, bitte. Also, nee. Hier ist die Frage, welche Konferenz der Vereinten Nationen ist das, die du erwähnt hast, die im nächsten Jahr stattfinden soll und welche genau ist das? Mhm. Can you please repeat? I didn't hear the interpretation. Okay, I can say it in English. So you, you mentioned the United Nations conference, for, which would um, take place next year. And um, someone would like to know which exactly conference is that and when exactly will it take place? Yes, the United Nations uh, summit for food systems. It's a um, Uh, it's a global event that will take place uh, towards the end of 2021. The date is not yet established. Um, unfortunately, uh, the uh, drivers of this event, the ones who are, are uh, coordinating the organization of this event, um, are not our allies. Uh, it's the uh, World Economic Forum, who's promoting a lot the agenda of corporations. Uh, and uh, also different uh, different United Nations institutions who uh, didn't prioritize in the process until now, didn't prioritize uh, uh, small farmers organizations. Uh, they actually involved uh, until now the industrial farmers only. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a difficult uh, process. Uh, we are trying to see what's the best way. Uh, we're still trying to see what's the best way to deal with this, uh, this event. Um, but uh, negotiating uh, uh, the voluntary guidelines for food systems and nutrition now in the Global Committee for Food uh, uh, Security, it's important because uh, in terms of uh, content, this is what the Global Committee for Food Security will present at this uh, summit. So uh, even if we're not uh, uh, going to be at the table, maybe, Uh, the content that will be presented there should also should speak about us. So um, this is a, a way to, to, to deal with this, uh, this summit. Okay. I hope that answered. Yeah, of, um, definitely. That's the question answered. I think the UN Food System Summit, which is in the tradition of the World Ernährungs Conference, um, will be next year. Ähm, stark beschäftigen. Mich würde, bevor die Zeit schreitet, vor, deshalb würde ich ähm, gleich weiter zu Genevieve gehen. Eine kurze Frage, die ähm, ich mir noch gestellt habe. Du hast ja gut dargestellt, ähm, was die, die Komplexität der UN-Prozesse, du hast ja auch noch mal deutlich gesagt, keiner wird die ähm, Untrop für uns implementieren. Also es wird immer diesen starken Kampf und Einsatz brauchen in den UN-Prozessen. Wo siehst du denn, aber was würdest du sagen, aus deiner Sicht ist die größte Herausforderung? Also ist es das, die Aufmerksamkeit, überhaupt die Bekanntheit der Untrug zu haben, dass sie in die Prozesse kommt? Sind das die politischen Gegner, äh, Kräfte, die Interessen daran haben, dass sie nicht in den Dokumenten steht? Wo siehst du aus Sicht von der Wirkampagne die größte Herausforderung, gerade bei der Umsetzung der Untrug auf UN-Ebene? Also in UN-Prozessen. multiple challenges, unfortunately. Uh, so first of all, uh, we're dealing with a historic discrimination. Um, and uh, there, are, there is very little awareness of how uh, marginalized uh, we have been uh, as, a, as a rural community and uh, rural people. And um, uh, our, own, uh, our own people, the, the small farmers, the peasants, Uh, they are not uh, um, supported enough to claim their own rights. So there is a lot of work there uh, to, to uh, build capacity on the ground. 
but there are uh, also obstacles in terms of uh, the uh, corporations and the, the uh, powerful and rich um, farmers and the agrobusinesses who uh, were the main, uh, the main factors that uh, uh, degraded our, our human rights. So their power is enormous. Uh, they um, they uh, influence governments to such an extent that governments uh, really uh, prioritize uh, the the rights of uh, corporations and the interest, the economic interest of corporations when they make uh, public policies. And uh, they are. Uh, it's very hard for governments to now. Uh, try to take a step back from that, take a, take a look at what uh, is happening in the world and also uh, address the real problems and uh, try to come up with real real solution instead of continuing with business as uh, usual. So, so the corporations are a huge obstacle and our governments are a huge uh, obstacle, especially governments from uh, industrialized and developed uh, countries. So uh, from Europe and uh, from North America, this, uh, these governments have been um, uh, quite blind to the problems of uh, of the poor, and quite deaf to our voice. And it's very very hard to uh, make ourselves heard uh, and to uh, be included in the in the discussions by these uh, by these governments. Generally, the governments from the the global south, from Latin America, Asia, Africa, have been much more sensitive to the problems of the poor and the problems of the marginalized uh, people. So uh, yeah, the, the the obstacles are are enormous and very very deep, unfortunately. Thank you, Sven. Um, Ramona, du bist ja nachher auch noch für in der Diskussion quasi dabei. Um, deshalb nochmal auch die um, der Hinweis: um, Alle Fragen gerne in die Fragen und Antwort Sektion schreiben. Es gibt nachher nochmal die Gelegenheit, um, auch weitere Fragen zu stellen. Um, ich um, freue mich jetzt ähm, Genevieve Savigny vorstellen zu dürfen. Sie ist auch Landwirtin, studierte Landwirtin. Sie ist seit 1992 bewirtschaftet sie ihren Hof im Südosten Frankreichs. Ähm, sie ist seit über 25 Jahren im französischen Bauernverband Confederation Paysanne tätig, dort auch Vorstandsmitglied. Sie war lange auch im Koordinierungskomitee der Europäischen ähm, Koordination von La Via Campesina und ähm, befasst sich entsprechend auch schon sehr lange mit den Rechten von Bäuerinnen und Bauern. Sie ist zudem seit 19, äh, 2015 auch Mitglied ähm, des Europäischen Wirtschafts- und Sozialausschusses mit der französischen Delegation für den Bund Pesan. Ähm, Genevieve, ähm, ich freue mich, dass ähm, du jetzt auch nochmal auf die Relevanz der UNTROP ähm, in Europa eingehen wirst und nach der konkreten Implementierung und Beispielen, aber eben auch Herausforderungen hier in Europa um, berichten um, wirst und wird dir jetzt das Wort übergeben. Yes, thank you. Um, hello to everybody. Um, I think in Europe we have a double responsibility. Um, first, because our model is really dominating the situation. Uh, like Ramona said, there is this question that a lot of uh, farms in Europe are industrialized. Well, in fact, it's a bit difficult also in Europe because we have a mixture of different types of farming, but um, the modernized uh, with a, a lot of investment model, which is more or less uh, uh, con considered as, as the, the European model, uh, seems to be um, exported to different countries and presented like a model or considered like a model by, by a lot of governments from other countries when in fact the other model, the peasant model, is the one which is employing um, over 70 percent of the population of farmers over the world. So this duality of models um, is something that um, makes uh, the situation a bit difficult um, because we, our model is really uh, uh, in influencing the world. But um, we know that also in Europe there are a lot of peasants and it is a situation in Eastern Europe a lot and Ramona will be able to come back on this uh, maybe later where it is dominating the, the picture in terms of numbers of people in rural areas. But um, also in Western countries, where we are affected by the same mechanisms, like the um, competitions with 
larger farms and larger businesses who are taking over the farms. Difficulties for young farmers to start farming because it's really difficult to find land and um, to get into the business, to, in, into the job. Um, and so this is, this is also um, why our responsibility is very big as European, but also us as European uh, small farmers organization to get involved from inside, from inside Europe, to influence European government to say, we have peasants, we are peasants, there are peasants in Europe like all over the world. It is really important also that there is this declaration on peasants and that it is written large and uh, very clearly with the definition, I think it is Article 5, I'm not, I, I don't remember exactly, but what it says that peasants are producing food on small scale, uh, all, all types of different uh, kind of um, production uh, uh, from uh, farmers to um, uh, animal farming, pastoralists, fisher folks, and there is kind of a continu continuity between farmers, landless, people who have other jobs. So, so it's a, a kind of um, a large definition, which is sometimes difficult for governments, I, I agree. But all of us, we, we depend on land, on, we depend on resources to make a living. So this is really um, what makes a difference. It is basic, it is vital. It is vital to have access to resources, to natural resources. And a lot of it is built on this, on this definition. So this is why uh, it is really important to get involved, either directly as farmers or as organizations to support farmers to have their voice in the, in the, in the picture. Um, so what can we do? What can we do in Europe? Um, of course, it is first very important to disseminate, to know about this declaration. And a lot of peasants uh, in different countries still don't know about this uh, tool and that it has been uh, uh, created. It has been, uh, it has been done because of the, of the, of the farmers themselves. So it's something really uh, everybody can be proud of. And so this is the first, maybe the first step to take. Uh, to make this declaration very well known everywhere. Um, and then there are two ways. Uh, I think Ramona went very deeply into the, um, the way you can take the declaration and put it forward, uh, either into uh, official processes, into the processes at the international, in the international bodies of the United Nations, um, but also at the, at the levels of countries. It can be a little tricky, I must say, because as, as it was said, the um, European governments in general were not really in favor of this declaration. So they didn't vote it for, they just abstained. Only for Portugal, Luxembourg, who voted in favor. And maybe another one, I forget. Um, so, but it can be one thing to do, to go to the governments again, to the Ministry of Agriculture, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Development, well, depending on the countries, and to ask them to put, to endorse it, to, to take a step to, to, to sign it. Um, actually, we've tried in France and some, uh, got some um, deputy supported us to ask a question to the government. Unfortunately, the reply is always the same. They believe in, um, in universal rights and they don't know what is a peasant, so whom does this, uh, does this um, declaration address? And, uh, and, and also, they, they see also some tricky issues with the right to land and the right to seeds. In France, it is very strong that the right to seeds, as we, we want it for peasants, really goes against the interests of big seed produ pro producers like Syngenta, Monsanto, or even smaller businesses, but who are really uh, export oriented and who want to be able to develop their technology and so on. Um, so maybe the other way to use it, and this is what we've been doing in France for the moment, is to try to understand the, the declaration and take parts of it to implement it through existing processes at European and national level. Um, 
I will give an example, uh, the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, which is always a big policy in Europe. Uh, it is possible for us, and it is our duty, to try to, to show more about what would be a development towards peasant agriculture, peasant agroecology, which is also a word that is used, that it is used in the declaration, and to move forward this agriculture when, in fact, you see through many different aspects in the CAP uh, that they are also pushing a lot towards uh, further uh, industrialization, further intensification through now what is called digital revolution and more investment in all these kind of digital tools and growing. Uh, well, they don't say it's going to grow to mean that you have to grow bigger, but basically this is what it is about bigger, more modernized, and um, more competitive on global market, and including a bit more the, the, the question of envi environment. So this is one model. The other model, which would be peasant agroecology, is mentioned in, in, in documents, but uh, it's very difficult to see it implemented. So for us, I think for farmers' organization, as well as for all allies, uh, this struggle will be very important in the coming in the coming uh, weeks uh, and months because again the common agricultural policy is being discussed is under discussion. What is new also and what is very important that um, at the moment the European Commission has um, put forward a strategy which is a, a strategy for a, a global strategy for food. It's part of the Green Deal. Uh, which is um, a program to make uh, Europe uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And part of it is a strategy from far farm to fork and including some objectives to make a food system more sustainable. So for us it is very important that food sovereignty, which is really the backbone of, um, of the declaration, it is very important that it is implemented and uh, and, and used um, in this farm to fork strategy and to support this farm to fork strategy, which of course is, uh, which is uh, challenged by industrial or large farms uh, who say it's not possible to, 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 to use less pesticides it's, or it, take, it will take time. So um, it is a, an ongoing process. It is at the European level, but also it will come to the national level. So it is also something where um, peasants have to be supported and the rights of peasants and the right to, have, to be supported in the uh, European policies. Uh, something which can also support peasants is the fact that European always claims to, to want to be inclusive. But now they have to prove it, that they can include the poorest, the the smallest farmer, the, the, and also all the new entrants, all the young people who would like to be to be included in the farming sector. But what will will it, it is also a challenge for us because that means that we'll have to discuss internally what would be what is a peasant, how do we describe them in the different situation, what is a peasant, who do we want to include in Germany, who do we want to include. Uh, in France, um, um, because um, it is, we don't have always the same um, vision of um, how necessary it is for someone to, to, to have access to land or to have access to, 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 the, to the resources and to a status, uh, but because this is our uh, European reality, you will be nothing, or you will not have the right to sell your products or to have land or to to cultivate your land unless you have all the necessary uh, uh, authorizations and papers and everything. So it is also something which is really very um, very present in your in your everyday uh, in everyday farmers' life. Um, to come back to some other examples, some other countries may choose also to, to have the countries move forward into the international negotiations. And this is, for example, the case of, uh, 
organization of, in Luxembourg. Since Luxembourg voted in favor of this declaration, uh, the organization which are supporting this process, especially uh, SOS FIN, Luxembourg, they are NGOs, uh, they have gathered all the well authorities and different NGOs and everybody to see how to move forward and to tackle the situation. And this has resulted into the decision to have an uh, intergroup between different ministries to 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 examine examine the situation and see how they can they can uh, they can move forward. So all, also at the institutional level, you have this kind of possibility uh, to to see how it can be also implemented in different processes and some international processes can be very important at, at some at some national level especially like it is now with germany being at the uh, having the presidency of the european union at the moment it's very important uh, that there is a move towards the government so that they take into account not only the needs of um, German farmers, but also of international peasants all over the world, uh, where the situation can be uh, very difficult. Um, challenges, I think the challenges, I think they, I've, I've already described a little that there is this duality of agriculture that not everybody is aware of because you have this kind of continuity. You have. Uh, big medium medium farms some farmers who would like to grow bigger to be to be more in, industrialized more mechanized um, although they are not that big and you have also um, large farms who are quite keen on not growing bigger but making a lot having a lot of employment and 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 who consider themselves as peasants so this question of who what is a peasant what is the agriculture what is farming in Europe, how we want to develop it, and how we pr protect uh, small, small farmers is really a question. Um, and um, also, I think, uh, so, well, this is really for me the main point, actually. This is why I wanted to insist on that. Um, and no, the other challenge which is very big is at the moment with the pretext of the COVID crisis or whatever, I think human rights are really under threat. Uh, globally, um, uh, the priority is not given to human rights, to personal life, but to um, uh, cooperation and uh, economic rights. So at the moment, there is a big challenge to have human rights truly recognized and for this uh, to the, the, the declaration on the rights of peasant can be a, a good, very good entry point because it is it is a new it is professional it is something that that we can use also as a tool uh, to protect all human rights so i think at the moment we have this kind also of responsibility I think that would be the, the, the end for, for now, and uh, I'll be happy to answer to all questions. Ja, vielen Dank, um, Genevieve, dass, um, für diesen um, spannenden Überblick und auch so diese konkreten Beispiele, was eben in der um, EU, auf EU-Ebene und was Ansatzpunkte eben auch in verschiedenen Ländern sind. Ich würde um, nochmal zu Gertrud um, übergeben, die die Fragen im Blick hat. Also ich sehe bisher keine Fragen. Ich könnte selber eine stellen. Ja, auf jeden Fall. Also Und zwar würde mich interessieren nochmal die, die Haltung des Europäischen Parlaments. Haben die dazu Stellung bezogen? Undrop oder zumindest vielleicht einige der, der politischen Gruppen im Europäischen Parlament. Well, maybe I can start. Well, they voted, um, they voted um, a resolution supporting the, the declaration, but that was in the previous uh, parliament. Now they have all changed. And because of this COVID crisis, I think it's been slowed down a lot. And I don't think it is on the top of the pile. 
So the work has to be done again to make them aware of the existence of this declaration. So it's probably uh, an, an, another task that we have on the table because now they, there is nothing new and, and they are new people. So we have to start again with many new people in the, in the parliament. So for the moment, there's nothing new with this new uh, legislation, with the new uh, group of uh, parliament in, in the parliament. Yeah, um, here's someone announcing. I have two questions. Could you please write your questions? Ach so, Entschuldigung. Ja, hier ähm, kündigt jemand an, dass ich zwei Fragen habe, aber bitte schreibe diese Fragen. Genau, vielleicht werden die noch geschrieben werden. Ah, da kommt. Es geht weiter. Ja, jetzt kommen zwei Fragen hier nochmal von. Also, eine Frage ist, ähm, sie hat eine Frage an Genevieve. Ähm, wie kann ein Kleinbauer, Kleinbäuerin geschützt werden von diesen Folgen von internationalem Handel? Ähm, die Preise zu drücken, nach unten zu drücken und ähm, überhaupt auch die ja, in die Lage gebracht zu sein, zu mit, mit so ganz super billigen Nahrungsmitteln ähm, im Wettbewerb zu stehen. Dass die, und sie fragt, ob die UNDROP darauf auch ähm, sich bezieht, ähm, was die UNDROP dazu sagt. Mhm. Yes, I think the question of income and access to decent income is addressed in the article 16, I think. Um, it's not as strong as we would have wished it to be in, in Europe, because for us it is quite vital, the question of decent income and the competition with, uh, with import. So there is also some, it is also mentioned that we should have access to local markets and that government should be able to have to to develop uh, policies and good good uh, policies. But it is also, yes, so there is enough to use it into discussions with on uh, um, concerning trade. And uh, so it is really something we have to do that is to, to, to go against trade agreements, new trade agreements like Mercosur and like CETA that are really going against our, um, our uh, income. So it is a tool. I don't think it is a strong tool for this. Uh, I, I guess it is stronger for, on the questions of land, seed, biodiversity, because it is something a bit new. Uh, for trade, it is a tool, but um, part, yes, it's part of, the, part of the discussion that we should have access to a decent income and to be able to have policies to protect small farmers for, against this. Gertrud, bitte. Ja, ist eine weitere Frage. Ähm, fragt jemand, wie sinnvoll ist es, überhaupt nur zu diskutieren, wer Kleinbauern, Kleinbäuerinnen sind? Ist es nicht wichtiger, möglichst viele Betriebe, also möglichst viele Betriebe und gesellschaftliche Gruppen mitzunehmen in den Prozess? Yes, yes, in, in, indeed, but um, it's another, it's something else. First, you need to have everybody, but then at one point there will, there will need to be discussions who you want, in you, when you get to policies, for instance, when you have, um, uh, do, do, um, for in, uh, when you have access to support, to subsidies, uh, the question will be, do you have, um, uh, how do you call it, um, a, a lower a limit of animals, for instance, will you get your subsidies if you have three cows or only if you have 30 cows? So this is also through these kind of criteria that you see if you are inclusive or not, if you support small peasants or not. So it, at one point it has to be discussed what are the limits. Do you take other peasants, everybody with, with, who has land or do you need um, or do you have some criteria? In England, with a cap, they excluded people who have less than five hectares. Um, in, in Romania, if they do this, they will exclude 90% uh, of the peasants. So you, you have 
uh, these discussions that are very concrete, but that they very refer to what is a peasant. What what do you consider as uh, as a peasant as needing uh, needing this the support or access to land? I give another example in France for access to land. When when you buy land or when someone wants to sell land, it goes through a, a body through an office, which is called a, a board, uh, which is called the staffer, where there is discussion about who will get the land and you have priorities and there's the, the discussion but also you have a, a, a rules there are rules that uh, there will be priority for people who have lost their land and who have to, to, to be relocated or to young farmers and then to small farmers who need a bit more so all those discussions are kind of an implementation of this um, of this vision of what is farming what which model we want to develop so, but I mean, it's not in uh, the discussion on what is a peasant must not be a preliminary discussion to exclude anybody, but just something to have in mind because it will come on the table one day. Um, okay, danke. Schon viel für einmal kurz, weil ich habe gesehen, es gehen jetzt ähm, kommen ähm, mehr Fragen rein, was total super ist. Im Anbetracht der fortgeschrittenen Zeit, ähm, vielleicht nur zwei kurze Anmerkungen. Ich glaube, zum einen würde ähm, würde ich Ramona noch mal dazu nehmen, also die Fragen, wenn ähm, Ramona du auch auf die Fragen antworten möchtest, oder wir gehen jetzt teilweise noch an beide Referentinnen, ähm, dass du vielleicht auch die Kamera anmachst und ein Mikro, dann ähm, kannst du mitdiskutieren. Und der andere, andere Punkt wäre, weil die Frage gerade auch noch mal aufkam, ähm, Georg Jansen war die ganze Zeit auch da, auch heute Morgen hatten wir ein technisches Problem mit dem Mikro, also mit ähm, der Zuschaltung. Und er wird jetzt statt der begrüßenden Worte ein paar abschließende Worte nachher sagen, also dass ähm, das machen wir dann am Schluss. Genau. Und jetzt würde ich wieder an Gertrud übergeben, die die Fragen ähm, fest im Blick ja, hat. Ja, danke. Hier ist eine Frage, die sich direkt gerade an die andere, die gerade beantwortet wurde, auch nochmal anschließt, aber sie doch ein bisschen konkretisiert. Und zwar ist die Frage, ob denn La Via Campesina in einzelnen Ländern bereits versucht, genauer zu definieren, wer ein, ein Kleinbauer, eine Kleinbäuerin ist. Genevieve oder Ramona, möchte, wer von euch möchte zuerst? <lacht> Stimmt, beide. Well, in some, <laughs> no, no, not, not, not really. In some countries it is obvious. You have very, very small farms, very, very big corporate farms. In Europe it is more difficult. Um, and it's not on the table for the moment. But for instance, there is a discussion at the moment at the European Union. It's kind of a, um, uh, it's one of the work that they're doing at the European Commission. They're discussing about farmers of tomorrow in 2040. What will, we, what will it be? And the work that was started does not mention peasant farming. It's either kind of corporate or kind of non-professional. So there is something wrong. We have to fight to be recognized as peasant farmers like uh, and who want to develop um, would want to develop so it's it's really um, and we want small farmers small young farmers to be included so it is really important to have this discussion who who will be the farmers of tomorrow who are, are the peasants at European level it is important over the world in some countries it is so obvious that that there's no no need for discussion ja, gut. Jetzt kommt eine Frage an beide Referentinnen gerichtet. Ähm, da fragt jemand, in der EU und besonders auch in Deutschland stehen der Verwirklichung der Unraubrechte viele Gesetze direkt entgegen und auch das politische Denken steht dem entgegen. Wo seht ihr aktuell die besten konkreten Ansatzpunkte? Ramona, möchtest du vielleicht ähm, zuerst? Oder äh, nochmal ein Spiel? Ramona ist. Ähm, I, I don't know. I, I, from what I know from Germany, I remember that there was quite a good network of uh, NGOs working on the topic, and I guess it is worth, it is worth working on the declaration itself and how to implement it in the different international processes. 
because there was this kind of good support from NGOs and from different uh, groups and um, uh, yes, international processes will be important at the moment. I don't know how. And this question, yeah, um, Ramona mentioned this food summit. It is something also to have in mind because it is the same question we have for farming. It's, it's the same question for food systems, uh, industrial food system, globalized or localized with peasants. And at the moment, this food system has been taken, uh, taken by, um, I would say, the representatives of the global food system. So it is important that they, they take into account that uh, many, many people in the world can, can eat because of small farmers and because of local food systems. And the, re the resilience of the, of the food systems and of society also relies on local, diversified, diversified uh, food producers with a lot of small farmers. So it is really important to, to have this, this in mind. The struggle is on. I think it is really very accurate at the moment. It's really, uh, there, there is a fight at the moment now. And they, and they are going stronger. I mean, the large ones, <laughs> the large ones. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's another um, question on trade issues. Sorry, so eine neue Frage an, an Handelsfragen. Die wurde auf Englisch gestellt. Ich stelle, lese sie mal auf Englisch vor. Decent income for farmers or living wages for agricultural workers would probably be an issue for the planned EU human rights due diligence um, and I think, I don't know, ERDD, maybe environmental rights due diligence directive, which is supposed to fully cover entire supply chains. Do you think the UNDROP should or could inform or strengthen this planned EU regulation? Yes. Yeah. No, oh, yes, completely. <laughs> yes, we have really to push that the uh, trade deals fully include, fully include all the human rights, rights of workers, uh, the environment, and all those progressive um, rights and directives. All should be included in the in the trade deal. If the if the trade deals are not stopped, they need to be fully, fully, fully included. Yes, sure, sure. Can I add something to that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so sure. much. And I'm really sorry for the, there was a short uh, interruption, uh, unfortunately, and the interpretation didn't work uh, briefly. I would just like to add that, unfortunately, we're living in this time of crisis. Uh, the first ones to take advantage of the crisis are the big industrial players who are trying to push forward for the uh, trade agenda. Uh, for uh, many years already, the trade has shaped public policies for uh, food and uh, agriculture. So uh, the public policies try to meet the needs of uh, profit, the needs of trade, rather than the needs of people for uh, nutrition, for decent incomes, for uh, human rights to be respected overall. So um, the, 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 this first uh, few months of uh, the COVID crisis since it started, we are witnessing how the corporations uh, and the large retailers are trying to uh, take full advantage of the chaos and the lack of capacity of government to respond urgently and to respond to all the problems that have been generated by the crisis. We see um, violations of the uh, workers, of the food workers, all across uh, the food production sector, from the meat production to the field, uh, to the pack packaging, and uh, in absolutely uh, everything that it means um, uh, food sector and uh, it's uh, it's really dramatic and we also see how some uh, more disadvantaged uh, countries are being uh, bullied in uh, by by uh, financial institutions like IMF or the World Bank to uh, privatize their natural resources in order to get money to uh, respond to the covid crisis so uh, the uh, the this crisis it's uh, certainly uh, going to make it harder for us to fight for the human rights, but that means it's more important. Uh, it's much more important now than ever to uh, fight, to change the paradigm, uh, to change the status quo, to change the business as usual, and to really um, 
push for the for the human rights because they they are important. If we don't do it by the end of this crisis, it's really going to be um, more than more than uh, uh, tragic and more than uh, dramatic. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ramona, ähm, Gertrud, ich denke, da ist eine Frage noch. Genau, ich glaube, das wäre dann vielleicht auch die abschließende, weil aufgrund der Zeit wir dann ähm, weiter gucken müssen. Ja. ja, genau. Eine Frage jetzt nochmal zu ähm, ja, den Ansätzen und Prozessen innerhalb von La Via Campesina. Da fragt jemand, wie der Prozess zur Undrop innerhalb von La Via Campesina oder auch von der europäischen, also ECVC, organisiert ist. Und spezieller noch, wie haltet ihr den Kontakt zur Basis und wie stellt ihr sicher, dass ihr euch nicht auf der UN-EU-Ebene, also dieser obergeordneten Policy-Ebene, verliert und möglicherweise dadurch Kraft verloren geht? Ramona oder Genevieve, wer von euch möchte beginnen? Ramona, Ramona, Ramona. <lacht> <laughs> okay, uh, I will start and if uh, Genevieve would like that, I would be very happy. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, when the COVID, um, I think, uh, again, like everybody else, the COVID uh, crisis has affected our way of work. Uh, and we we spent the first uh, months, um, since, since it started, we spent the first uh, months to try to evaluate the situation, what is going on in the ground and visibilize the problems of the of the farmers the small farmers and uh, make them uh, known to the authorities make them known to the media make them known amongst our members uh, so that they know that we're confronting basically with the same uh, problems and so that we they also know that there are common solutions uh, that can be used uh, so uh, this was uh, this was part of it and we also try to find a system that uh, Uh, a new system of communication and of work uh, in considering the fact that we could not meet and considering the fact that we are dealing with uh, problems uh, in the production in our farm that normally uh, don't occur in uh, in normal circumstances so um, I think uh, well, what's important to say is also that in in La Via Campesina Europe we are organized in uh, working groups who actually um, found a way to continue to work Uh, and um, for the peasant rights specifically, we try to use uh, the process on CAP, which uh, is an ongoing process and it's been a priority in the past year uh, for ECVC. So to try to push in the debate in, of, for the common agriculture policy for as much content as possible uh, that would introduce more uh, the, the rights of peasants Uh, and everything that is articulated in the in the declaration, uh, not and not only in the cap but also in the debates for this uh, new strategy that was uh, very urgently, uh, quickly uh, discussed by the European Commission. I mean, not only the European Commission, the farm to fork uh, strategy. So we try to bring elements from the declaration also there. Um, in the same time, the um, People from the ground didn't stop uh, working. We've been using um, for specific struggles. Uh, we've been using the rights of peasants, uh, not only for members' organizations, but also supporting um, farmers or organizations from uh, other countries where we don't have yet uh, membership. For example, we uh, supported quite a lot the struggle for land in uh, Ukraine, using a lot uh, the peasant rights declaration and using the connection with Uh, institutions that were creating, recreated during uh, the lobbying for uh, for peasant rights. Uh, for example, we uh, used a lot the uh, connection with FAO, with the Food and Agriculture Organization, to try to influence the government of Ukraine uh, in that sense. And um, in the ground, people continue to produce So materials of information uh, for public awareness on uh, peasant rights, translating uh, uh, the declaration in different languages, uh, and uh, including in the national debates uh, related to common agriculture policy, including uh, again as much as possible from the uh, declaration, from the, from the peasant rights uh, declaration. Uh, the strategy um, that was uh, planned by La Via Campesina Europe uh, following the adoption of the declaration was um, uh, shaped last year. 
during a big seminar that we organized uh, internally and also where we invited uh, uh, partners and different allies organizations. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a strategy that in, uh, you know, speaks about how to incorporate in absolutely everything we're doing uh, this, uh, this instrument. Um, and uh, I think that in the first part when we made this, the presentation, we uh, shared, uh, you know, uh, we shared the, quite a lot about uh, of this uh, strategy. But what's important is our capacity to adapt to the crisis, to adapt the work to the crisis. Um, because, uh, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not very easy to um, visualize our messages and to, uh, especially to talk to governments. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, the, the work and the strategy at European level is uh, continuous, continuing to adapt and it's uh, quite, uh, quite complex and I hope that answers at least partially the, the question and if there's a more specific question, I'd be happy to answer. Danke, um, Ramona. Um, Genevic, möchtest du noch was ergänzen um, dazu? Dann ansonsten würde ich... No. <lacht> no. <lacht> okay, uh, genau. Dann danke, Ramona, für den Überblick und um, vielen Dank auch dir, Genevieve. Ich würde nämlich jetzt, weil wir wirklich schon, um, das ist schon halb, um, schnell an Georg Jansen übergeben, den Bundesgeschäftsführer der um, ABL. Ich freue mich sehr, Georg, dass du dabei bist und dass du auch das ganze Seminar begleiten wirst. Jetzt ist es kein Grußwort mehr, sondern sind es abschließende Worte, aber ich würde dir mal das Wort übergeben jetzt. Ja, vielen Dank äh, an Lena. Ich habe äh, das Grußwort gehalten, äh, aber äh, ihr habt mich nicht verstanden, ihr habt mich nicht hören können. Ich glaube, das äh, geht äh, uns äh, vielen so. Äh, wir haben viele gute Positionen und Forderungen in den letzten Jahrzehnten äh, aufgestellt. Aber es hat viel Kraft gekostet, damit diese Forderungen und Positionen auch erhört werden. Ich möchte mich erstmal bedanken äh, bei Lena, bei Paula und äh, bei Gertrud, äh, dass ihr diesen Diskussionsprozess hier erneut wieder ankurbelt und uns äh, auch äh, abringt, dass wir uns damit auseinandersetzen, diejenigen, die auch in den aktuellen agrarpolitischen Auseinandersetzungen drinstehen. Und äh, ich möchte mich auch sehr bedanken bei Ramona und Genevieve. Äh, ich bin selber äh, ein, kein Sprachgenie, sondern ganz schwach in, auf dem internationalen Parkett. Deshalb kämpfe ich seit 37 Jahren hier in Deutschland für die Änderung der Agrarpolitik, gerade in Richtung kleine und mittelbäuerliche Landwirtschaft. Ich habe hohen Respekt vor eurer Arbeit durch Lena, Gertrud, Paula, Genevieve, Ramona. Es ist ja kein Wunder, dass da jetzt nur Frauen sind. Ihr bringt es voran, dass wir uns damit auseinandersetzen und deshalb äh, hohen Respekt, aber auch nochmal vielen Dank von meiner Seite, dass ihr das tut. Ich will eine Sache äh, in den Mittelpunkt stellen. Wir hatten gerade die, eine äh, europäische Agrarministerkonferenz in Koblenz am Rhein, äh, wo die Ministerinnen und Minister sich drei Tage getroffen haben. Und es gab eine Sitzung, wo die Ratspräsidentin, die deutsche Agrarministerin Klöckner, alle Organisationen eingeladen hatte für eine Stunde, um sich anzuhören, warum denn überhaupt Proteste sind bei dieser Agrarministerkonferenz. Es waren viele Organisationen da und ich hatte die Gelegenheit, als Erster zu sprechen und habe darauf hingewiesen, wo wir einig sind, Nämlich, dass die europäische Agrarpolitik geändert werden muss. Die Preispolitik, die Bodenpolitik, in der Frage der Gentechnik äh, und aber auch in der Auseinandersetzung um das EU-Mercosur-Abkommen. Und es war für mich überraschend, dass viele dieser Protestorganisationen, die sonst noch nicht so sehr zusammengearbeitet haben, äh, sich auf verschiedene Punkte verständigen konnten. Wir sind uns einig geworden, die 
europäischen Minister und Ministerinnen aufzufordern, dass das EU-Mercosur-Abkommen dringend gestoppt werden muss. Weil nicht nur, weil man nicht mit einem Faschisten einen Vertrag unterschreiben sollte, sondern weil es dringend ist, dass wir die Klimafrage und die Menschenrechtsfrage verbinden, auch mit der wirtschaftlichen Existenzfrage der Betriebe. Und das scheint mir ein wichtiger Punkt zu sein, den wir hier heute auch in der Diskussion herausgelöst haben. Wie kriegen wir denn Bündnispartner? Und ich habe deshalb die Frage gestellt, wir sollten uns nicht so sehr verengen, schon gar nicht auf eine Definitionsfrage, bist du denn mit drei Kühen ein Kleinbauer oder bist du mit 30 Kühen ein Kleinbauer? Wir kommen in eine Situation, wo es insgesamt darum geht, wie die Landwirtschaft in Europa, wie sie die Landwirtschaft in der Welt und in den einzelnen Mitgliedsländern überhaupt noch gerettet werden kann gegenüber der Konzernmacht. Und deshalb gibt es auch Zusammenschlüsse. Und ich will am Schluss sagen, wir haben seit zehn Jahren, die gehen wir auf die Straße mit der Wir haben satt demonstration in Berlin anlässlich der Internationalen Grünen Woche. Wir haben seit fünf Jahren auf dem Programm, dass wir uns aufmachen, auch zur internationalen Agrarministerkonferenz, die stattfindet, immer mit 60, 70 Ministerinnen und Ministern. Ich bin euch sehr dankbar, dass ihr reingebracht habt, die Auseinandersetzung um die internationalen Bauernrechte. Und sie ist tatsächlich auch in diese Konferenz mittlerweile eingeflossen. Es ist ein dickes und schweres Brett, was wir da zu bohren haben. Aber wir haben uns gesagt, wir brauchen starke gesellschaftliche Bündnispartner, um diese Frage der Bauernrechte auch mit einem derartigen politischen Druck zu versehen, dass wir sagen können, wir haben auch etwas erreicht und wir sind meines Erachtens auf einem guten Weg. Ich nenne noch mal den Stichpunkt EU-Mercosur-Abkommen. An dieser Frage können wir eine breite Einheit hinbekommen, dass dieses Abkommen nicht zustande kommt. Und das wäre ein großer Erfolg, auch gegenüber den Staaten, die meinen, sie könnten immer noch mit der Landwirtschaft Schlitten fahren. Ich bin der Auffassung, diese Welt braucht die bäuerliche Landwirtschaft. Covid-19 hat gezeigt, dass die internationalen globalisierten Lieferketten zusammengebrochen sind. Es gibt eine neue Diskussion in den Gesellschaften, wie denn überhaupt Ernährung, Ernährungssouveränität äh, zu realisieren ist. Und deshalb lasst uns gemeinsam auch die beiden nächsten Konferenztage bestreiten und überlegen, wie wir hier tatsächlich zu Erfolgen kommen. Wir haben es uns durch unsere langjährige Arbeit verdient. Vielen Dank. Danke dir, Georg, dass du so wunderbar ähm, das Abgerunden zusammengebunden hast und nochmal vor allen Dingen auch den Bezug von der internationalen europäischen Ebene hier zu Deutschland hergestellt hast. Ich schließe jetzt das Webinar nochmal mit dem Hinweis auf Dienstag. Georg hat es gerade schon gesagt, zum zweiten Online-Seminar um 9 Uhr und sowie dann am Mittwoch dem Präsenzseminar in Kassel. Eine letzte Anmerkung noch. Noch ein vielen Dank an die Übersetzerinnen, die uns hier die ganze Zeit jetzt die Präsentation und die Fragen übersetzt haben. Und vielen Dank natürlich an alle Referentinnen und Referenten. Und ähm, am Dienstagmorgen sind wir mit Michael Windfuh vom Deutschen Institut für Menschenrechte und Anna Maria Torres Franke von Vier International, die seit vielen Jahren vor allem in Genf auch die, ähm, die Verhandlungen und den Kampf um die, für die UNTROP begleitet hat. Genau, und ähm, wünsche allen einen, einen schönen Freitag und vor allen Dingen ein schönes Wochenende. Tschüss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody.